Coming up on Eyewitness News at 6, Nevada's special session is being delayed as the battle over how much needs to be cut from state spending rages on. And more people are out of work in Nevada than at any time in the past 14 years. Plus, damage to foreclosed homes makes them tougher to sell. Coming up, a story of one man who seemed bent on destroying his before the bank takes it over. This is Channel 8 Eyewitness News at 6 in high definition. And good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. At the 11th hour, the governor changed course and decided to delay that special session. It was supposed to begin on Monday. Now it won't start until Friday the 27th. Governor Gibbons said in a release the lawmakers needed more time to understand new financial projections. Higher than expected unemployment and sagging tourism figures could lead to an even higher shortfall. State Senator Stephen Horsford says the constant fight between lawmakers and the governor erodes trust in the system. His actions are ir irresponsible. We don't know if we can trust the information that's giving, given to us. The governor's staff and the legislature's fiscal group dispute the total shortfall. Today's economic forum put the additional losses at $250 million, while the Democrats counter saying the total is only about $100 million. Whatever the new amount, it will hurt. $914 million in cuts have already been made. State agencies, education leaders, and everybody else who gets state money are digging in, trying to protect every nickel. I-team political analyst John Ralston joining us now with this uh, late afternoon development. Why did they decide to postpone it till next Friday? Any idea? You know, you're kind of starting to think that we could like do the Karnak imitation and come up with a better number than <laughs> anybody else has so far. <laughs> I mean, it's really tough to, for the average person to figure out what's going on. What is the real number? They, they started this economic forum about 10, 15 years ago to try to get an independent analysis, which now the Democrats are casting aspersions on because it didn't come out the way that they said it was, and it looks a lot more like Jim Gibbons' numbers. They're pointing out the partisan makeup. That's all just silliness now they got to fix it they have no choice now but to fill a 250 million dollar hole remember too that is on top of a 900 million hole already we're over a billion dollars now which is a huge percentage of the budget i just don't think that they were ready to really handle it not the staff or the lawmakers uh, the next session is what three days can they do this in three days? Can they do it before a session even starts? Well, that's that's the whole point, exactly, Gary, is, 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 is what you're talking about. They're going to try to get together. In fact, the reason that the governor decided to delay this was that Bill Raggio, the head of the Senate, and Barbara Buckley, the head of the Assembly, agreed this morning, before the Economic Forum even came out with the numbers, that they're going to try to get together and get a consensus. That's what the next week is going to be about. The question is, what kind of consensus do you come to for $250 million in cuts? That is a lot of money. They, you know, they talked about delaying those pay raises. That's about half of it. Then again, the Democrats have said that's dead. You know, only in the legislative process do things that are dead suddenly come back, come back to, to life. life. Exactly. Okay. All right, going to be a long week. It is indeed. <laughs> Thanks, John. John, and you'll watch every minute of it for us. Thanks. The economy will be a big topic when the presidential candidates visit Las Vegas next week. Barack Obama's campaign announced he'll be here on, third, on Tuesday. John McCain will visit on Wednesday for a fundraiser. Nevada's unemployment rate is now at the highest it has ever been. In fact, in 14 years, the rate rose to 6.2% in May. That's compared to a national average of 5.5%. More than 82,000 people here are out of work. Economists say the causes are nearly two years of housing slumps, a, de a decreasing number of visitors this year, and the fact that guests are just spending less. A UNLV economics professor says May numbers can be deceptive, though, because high school and college graduates move into the workforce that month. That the new entrants into the labor force seeking jobs are uh, finding that the economy is slow and they're not finding jobs. Economists think the Nevada economy should turn around hopefully sometime next year. A Las Vegas man is so upset about losing his home to foreclosure, he's destroying it. His neighbors are upset because they say it's affecting their property values. The house is located near Buffalo and Tropicana, and our cameras were rolling as all of it unfolded. Eyewitness News reporter Travel Island is live with the details. Travel. Well, Gary, neighbors in this community are very upset. They tell me for the last week they've had to listen to lots of banging and other kinds of noises coming from inside of this home you see in the background. Now, they called the police to put an end to it, but police told them they could do nothing about it because the owner still is the legal owner of the home. 
couple nights ago started to hear noise out the back fence. What used to be a quiet neighborhood now sounds like a construction zone. This guy's like trash in the place. This woman didn't want her face shown, but she says her neighbor is losing his home to foreclosure. He's upset and taking his anger out on the house. Yeah, frustration, but taking it out on the wrong person. Maybe he need, needs to go back to his lender. Taking it out on us, the neighbors, is not, not right. Our cameras caught the man throwing junk into his backyard. Neighbors say this is nothing compared to what's happened over the past few nights. Fireworks inside two nights in a row. It's like 4th of July for this guy. He even drilled holes into the walls and spray painted them. Neighbors say destroying the home isn't hurting the bank, but hurting their community. Around here, all these houses are nicely kept. And this has been, this has the worst house on this street and has been for years. Um, the trees are dead, the, the water's not running. It's, it's just a mess, a total mess. Brings the value of our houses down. We tried to talk to the owner. He just thought that you might want to talk to us about the problems that you were going through. He refused to comment. In fact, he's refusing to come out of the house at all. The doors are glued shut, and there was a note posted saying he won't be evicted. There's a lot of people losing their houses, but why destroy it? Why, why destroy it? The, the bank's got to pay for it at the end of the day. The bank that now owns this home will have to clean it all up, put in new windows, and paint the walls. But until that happens, neighbors say they will suffer because they have to live near the mess. A house in the state that it's in right now is not going to be a real sellable, viable property for maybe months and months to come, especially in this market. And whoever buys it is going to spend a fortune fixing it up. Now, we did a record search and found out that the man who owns this home also owns two other homes in Las Vegas. Those two properties are also going through the foreclosure process. Neighbors also tell me that the man who owns this home is actually the owner of a luxury mortgage company here in Las Vegas. Reporting live, Travel Island, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. The judge handling the O.J. Simpson robbery case says the list of questions which will be sent to prospective jurors is the longest she's ever seen. Attorneys for Simpson and his two co-defendants met with prosecutors and Judge Jackie Glass today to hash out the juror questionnaire. The two sides submitted 81 questions in all, which extended to 15 pages. The judge ordered four of those questions removed. The questionnaire will be used to screen potential jurors to try to speed up the jury selection process. So every one of you is on notice right now that we're not regurgitating anything that's in here, that this jury selection is not going to go on for a significant length of time, that this is, the, this is what we're going to use to get as much information as we can. We tried but didn't get a copy of those jury instructions today. Also today, the judge denied for the second time a motion to try the defendants separately, attorneys for Simpson's co-defendants, C.J. Stewart and Charles Ehrlich, say it's not fair to try them alongside Simpson. Allegations of child abuse and neglect have now been filed against the parents of a four-year-old boy who died after he was left alone in the family's SUV. And the couple's four other minor children remain in protective custody, at least for now. Reporter Allison McCarthy was at family court today and joins us now with the latest on what happened today in this case. Allison? Denise, a young disabled boy dies after investigators say he was left alone for 17 hours in the family's car. In the strong emotions surrounding this case and the ongoing investigation of the parents, it may be easy to forget that the lives of four of the children were also devastated that day. They were removed from their home, separated from their parents, and lost their baby brother forever. For their own protection, we will likely never meet four-year-old Jason Reimer's older brothers and sisters. The day one of them found Jason's lifeless body inside the family's Ford excursion, police took the four surviving minors into protective custody. That was 11 days ago. In light of all the circumstances, they're, they're, they're holding up rather well. You know, it's a grieving process for them as well. They've had their parents taken away from them. They're out of their home. Um, but. They're, they're strong little children, and as well as teenagers, so they're doing the best they can. The four children, ages 8 to 15, remain at Child Haven for now, where the judge allows them to have supervised visits with their parents. Stanley and Colleen Reimer had no comment as they left family court this morning. Cameras are not allowed inside, but the couple reportedly denied the numerous allegations filed by the state, including child abuse and neglect in the death of their son. Attorneys say the judge also made it clear he was not happy that despite what the surviving children have been through, they still have not received any professional counseling yet. Whose responsibility is to get these kids some counseling? Well, they're in the custody of the Department of Family Services. Um, 
and I think Judge Sullivan today made it pretty clear that he's he wants them to get whatever counseling they need from here on out on a daily basis if necessary. The judge ruled until that counseling gets underway and until other responsible family members can be properly screened, the Reimer children will remain at Child Haven. Their parents face an August trial date on the civil child abuse and neglect allegations. And Metro's investigation into Jason Reimer's death is still ongoing. No criminal charges have yet been filed. Attorneys for Stanley and Colleen Reimer would not comment on the specific allegations against their clients, saying they have not yet had a chance to see any of the state's notes, police reports, or even the children's interviews. But the Channel 8 I team has uncovered information that there have been more than 20 reports of abuse and neglect filed with the Department of Family Services against the Reimers in the past 20 years. Denise and Gary. Allison, thanks. North Las Vegas has had a rash of vacant homes burn in recent weeks. The city took the homes years ago for new road construction. Still ahead, we'll look at why they haven't been demolished yet. Plus, the UNLV Rebel basketball team's trip to Australia will certainly be an educational experience. Some will even earn college credit for it. We'll have more later in Eyewitness Sports. But first, let's check in with Gina. Summer is officially here and it feels like it. As you know, it's been hot over the past couple of days and tomorrow will be even hotter. I will show you the forecast high temperature for tomorrow and the complete forecast for the first weekend of summer. All coming up on Eyewitness News at 6. This is Channel 8 Eyewitness News at 6 in high definition. Four fires in four buildings in less than a month on 5th Street in North Las Vegas. All of them arson in abandoned homes that belong to the city and have been sitting there vacant for years now. These boarded up homes are all within the 5th Street project funded by the Regional Transportation Commission. The city of North Las Vegas is responsible for bringing down these homes to make way for that project, but for five years they have stood there untouched. We talked with the North Las Vegas Public Works Director, Chong Lu, to find out what's being done and when they plan to demolish them. She says it's taking time because each one has to be checked thoroughly for hazardous materials, and if the materials are found, they have to be properly disposed of. They say they don't want to speed up the process. They want to keep the neighbors safe. As of t um, last week, we have about uh, 19 homes still standing. Half of them already went through the first step, which is the assessments, now waiting for abatement. That abatement she's referring to is cleaning up and disposing of those hazardous materials, materials like asbestos. Well, still to come here on Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock, a man accused of preying on young children in dark local movie theaters. Also, concerns about a toxic element polluting the water supply of Southern Nevada. And it was a hot week in Southern Nevada, so you should be ready for the hot weekend. Gina has a good weather forecast right after this. You're watching Channel 8 Eyewitness News at 6 with Gary Waddell and Paula Francis. The first local news in HD. Gas prices have steadied over the last few days after that amazing run-up heading into the weekend. The average price here in Southern Nevada, 428, 20 cents higher though than the national average. Oil rose today to above $135 a barrel today, ahead of a meeting of oil producing and consuming nations, uh, which has been called by Saudi Arabia. That meeting will be to discuss ways to try and stop the run-up in oil prices. To cut costs, United Airlines is putting in place some new restrictions that will mean higher prices and less flexibility flexibility for travelers. United will begin requiring minimum stays for nearly all domestic flights beginning in October and will raise its cheapest fares as much as $90 one way. United will require a one to three night or weekend night minimum stay on flights. Business travelers especially won't like the new rules because it'll hurt their ability to leave on a trip early in the morning and still make it home at night. Henderson police have arrested a man and charged him with sexual misconduct. They say he preyed on young girls in movie theaters. Police say John Jacobs would sit next to the young girls and inappropriately touch them. Right now there are two victims, a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old, but investigators believe there may be more. Anyone who can help Henderson police is asked to call 267-4750. The head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority is raising concerns about the amount of toxic uranium in the Colorado River. 
The Colorado feeds Lake Mead, which is Southern Nevada's main source of water. I-Team Chief Investigator George Knapp has been reporting on a large pile of Luranium tailings from mining operations near the river for years now. Well, on Monday, Pat Mulroy sent a letter to the Secretary of the Interior asking the department to evaluate the effect on water quality before allowing new mining. Mulroy had previously told Eyewitness News the uranium dissipated before it made it to Lake Mead. Currently, Southern Nevada tap water does meet federal quality standards, but if you'd like to look at that full report, you can go to lasvegasnow.com. All right, it's right up there by Moab. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're experiencing summer, as are we. Probably yes. warm up there, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Man. It's hot, and now that it's summer, at least we have justification. It's, it's ah, yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> and, of course, the fact that we're in the desert southwest. This is the way it goes. Here's a look from the Southeast Career Technical Academy. Over the past eight hours, really not much difference from the start of the day to the end, with the exception of the fact that it's now officially summer. Happened at 459, the summer solstice. So here it is, current number, Mountain Vista. It's hot, 111. High temperature here today, 114 degrees. The night low temperature in the mid 80s. A light breeze out of the east southeast at 3 miles per hour. A gust earlier of 20 miles per hour, no big deal. Humidity is just 5%, so it's hot and it's dry for the entire valley. Here's a look at the high temperatures we reached today. Everyone, almost everyone, in the triple digits. Red Rock Visitor Center, very close. 99 was the high temperature there today. East Washington, 109. East Cary, 110. El Dorado, 112. Mountain Vista, 114. West Tropicana, 106. South Durango, 104. Also 104, West Alta. Gowan and Commerce, 107. Lake Mead and Jones, 106. Lamb, 108. Down to the south here, 111 for Warm Springs, 109 for the 215 in Green Valley Parkway, Anthem 107, Las Vegas Boulevard South, 113 degrees. Beatty, 103, Pioche, 100, everyone outside the valley in the triple digits here, including Boulder City, 109 was the high temperature there. Officially at McCarran International Airport, we hit a high temperature of 107. Not a record above the average, the normal for this time of year is 101. There you see the record, 113, although we did hit 113 in some neighborhoods. Still, the official number is taken at McCarran International Airport, so it doesn't go into the record books. It's all thanks to an area of high pressure that's been sitting over the desert southwest for the past couple of days. We've had hot weather. It's going to get hotter tomorrow. This area of high pressure, I think, will peak in its strength tomorrow. Then as we move through the next couple of days, an area of low pressure in the Pacific Northwest will slide off to our north. It will allow for a few clouds from time to time, and it will allow for a nice breeze to pick up, and we need it, considering the current temperature is 106 at the airport. Off to our east, Denver, 72, a little cooler there. Of course, they're in the mountains. Plus, we've got some wet weather going on here. Some of it is severe. I have seen reports of tornadoes with this line of weather that will continue to march off to the east as we move through the night tonight. So if you have some travel plans, be ready for some delays right over the mountains, thanks to the severe weather. For us, though, looking pretty nice. It will be hot as we head through the upcoming weekend. Here's the forecast for the next seven days. High temperature tomorrow, 109. Staying hot as we move in through the upcoming weekend. But look, our numbers come down by a few degrees. 105 is the forecast high for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. 106 for Thursday. Then we're back down in quotes to 105. Chris Matthews is here now with Eyewitness Sports. All right, thanks, Gina. 105, the magic number. How about the Rebels getting ready to leave for Australia? Boy, for some, it's more than a trip down under. Plus, wink Adam injured at today's practice. I'll have the latest. Also, who's sitting on top of that Travelers Championship leaderboard? I'll show you next here on Channel 8. Now, Channel 8 Eyewitness Sports with Chris Matthews. Well, a week from today, and UNLV will have already played two games in Sydney, Australia. It's not going to be 100% fun and games for all the Rebels because a handful of these guys are earning school credit. School's out, and for these guys, it's a chance to spend two weeks in Australia. It'll be different. I hear it's a little more like laid back there, and 
and stuff like that. So it'll be it'll be very interesting. I'm a little jealous, you know, they have access, but I'm sure they're going to say we have access as well. You know, uh, just testing some new food out. You know, I heard you got to be watch, you got to be careful what you eat out there. And then, you know, I'm trying to see a little, a uh, few sites. You know, the little outback. It's part of the NCAA rationalization that once every four years, you can take a foreign trip, and that gives kids a chance to travel and experience something that maybe they hadn't before, or, or maybe never will. Seeing another part of the world is one of the perks of playing at UNLV. Australia brings to mind many things. Kangaroos, beach, kangaroo, and sharks. Crocodile, crocodile dundee, yeah. <laughs> For about half the team, it's 100% fun and games and a chance to see and visit another culture. For the other half, it's a little more. Some of these guys will get school credit. Well, we got a class. We're taking a class that uh, we got to uh, get used to the Australian culture and research papers. So. Don't be mistaken, the five or so players who will do research on the country won't be spending the nights hitting the books. Uh, not that they're really excited about that part of it, but uh, <laughs> why not? If you got a chance to, to learn about a culture and uh, report on it as well. This will be the second foreign trip for UNLV in about six years. It's just that the last time UNLV went tripping, it wasn't quite the same. Hey, we got to go to Van uh, Canada. We went to Vancouver. Like the first year I got here, they was going to Canada. Now I'm leaving, they're going to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't yeah. seem fair. Yeah, if not. <laughs> but I'm really happy for that. So be true to your school. All right, hey, here's a scary moment today. Check it out, Rebel fans. Wink Adams crumbles to the ground and rolled his ankle. He needed treatment, but we understand he is okay and will make the trip to Australia. Round two of the Travelers Championship. There was a four-way tie after the first round. We have a new leader at Stuart Sink. He hits two eagles. This one, a 49-footer. Sink is seeking his first win of the season. He's halfway there with today's 64. He's on top at 10 under par. Eyewitness News will be right back. That's it for Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock with the first 6 o'clock of the summer. Yes, it so sure is, it. isn't it? If you'd like any more information on any of tonight's stories, you can go to our website, lasvegasnow.com. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here tonight at 11 o'clock.